Mark Hans Richer from Harley Davidson. Thanks for joining me Jenny today. Rooney. It's good to see you again. Nice to see you again. It's How been are a little you? while. I'm good. Yes. I'm good. I'm glad to hear that. So you actually, let's start by talking about you. You've been in this role now since 2007. Right, almost which six is years. Quite a long time for for CMOs, yeah. even though the don't jinx me. The tenure Jenny. is going up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. we're looking forward to the next six. Yeah, right. What's the secret to your staying power? Well. Um, I, I don't know that I've thought about that too much. We, we've had a lot going on. Yeah. Every business has had a lot of challenges in the last five or six years. Um, I, I guess the thing that's kept us going very strongly has been the fact that we have not taken our eye off our customers during that time. Mm. Uh, we didn't turn inward. Um, and because we were continued to stay focused on our customers, that gave me the kind of support that I needed within Harley to do more things for our customers. Right. And uh, and that's been that's been terrific. So it's really I guess the support of the Harley organization tied to their strong belief in the importance of our customers. It's given me a lot a lot of uh, ability to to do what I need to do. Well, and you I mean you are actually you've sort of established yourself as is a, a renegade marketer, if you will. I mean you, you take chances. I remember working on a story about you a few years back and um, we talked about how you you burned up the marketing playbook mm. you know I had a blowtorch yes, yes. exactly yes. <laughs> um, you know so you've sort of established yourself as a CMO who is uh -huh. of that ilk um, but let's talk about those chances you take you know for example you you a couple years ago opted for crowdsourced a crowdsourced advertising campaign as right. opposed to sort of working the more traditional route with um, a traditional ad mm -hmm. agency. Right. So let's talk about the risks you take and sort of, you know, why you take them and, and what you're weighing them against. Sure. Well, you know, I think taking risks for risk's sake doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, crowdsourcing, in our way of applying it, was not about a campaign. So it wasn't like, hey, we're going to do a Super Bowl ad where people give us their ideas and we'll pick one and someone will be the lucky winner. Mm -hmm. For us, it was more about a process. And it's not much different from the processes we've always had at Harley-Davidson from before I got there, where we were very much informed by where our customers were and what do they really want and how do they express to us the things that are most interesting to them. Mm -hmm. And so we've been a very customer-led business for, we're 110 years old now this year. And, um, and that's been true in the kinds of motorcycles that we make, the, the kinds of clothes we produce. And, and the kinds of experiences we create for our customers. And so why wouldn't that apply also to the marketing? Sure. When, when we get customer inspiration out in the street, when they're you know, showing us the great designs and, and inspirations that they've created for themselves through us, mm. what more could we do with that for marketing? So put customer light at the heart of it, mm. use them as the inspiration as we do in the rest of our business, and see what comes out. And so it started a little bit as an experiment, as most of these things do. And it was impressive, the, the, the ideas coming from you know, the people who are most emotionally invested in the brand were impressive. They, mm -hmm. they knew how to talk to themselves with the things that were interest, they were interested in. And so, you know, it, we, we were able to turn the majority of our creative development over to our fans through Facebook called The Fan Machine. Mm. And, um, and it's very rich. Now, we can't do everything with it because you know, we can't do catalogs with it. Sometimes right. there's new products that we can't tell people about, so it's sort of hard to use it for everything. But for the most part, the principle is very similar to what we've always had at Harley. So you obviously have this extremely iconic brand. You have this rich history. And frankly, that's what all marketers are, are really trying to grab right. hold of these right. days. Um, and this, you know, everybody's talking about consumer engagement and having this really strong relationship with their customers. Right. Um, I would imagine, though, the challenge for you is, you know, staying true to your core, your core target customer, mm -hmm. but then expanding and trying to attract new customers to the brand. And, right. and, and in this day and age, we're coming off of, you know, some difficult years financially and economically for people. Um, a motorcycle might be a luxury that they don't necessarily want to spend money on if mm -hmm. they've got other financial considerations. And also a younger market, you know, a younger target um, audience might not consider you know, motorcycles is, mm -hmm. is an aspect of their lives. So mm -hmm. how are you working to, you know, obviously stay true to your core kind of community, if you right. will, but also expand out and attract new people? Well, it's a great question, Jenny, and I think I'd reframe it just a bit and say we're, our, our, our path is staying true to our core ideals, mm. not as much about a certain customer type, because okay. we have so many different types of customers. So define who your customer is these well, days. Well, it's hard to define. Okay. So our, uh, the ads we most recently have run are called hashtag stereotypical Harley. And the reason we call it that is because there is no stereotypical Harley rider. And they really cut across socioeconomic divides, political divides, mm -hmm. gender divides, racial divides. 
um, countries all over the world. It's very hard to really define it as a typical type of person. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's really the great thing about the brand is how dimensional it is, mm -hmm. but it's because the idea within it is so rich. Mm -hmm. So the ideas of, you know, of, of personal freedom or, or, you know, rebelling against something keeping you back from being your true self. I mean, those are rich ideas that are very humanistic. That, not, not that really, transcend. Not really captured in one generation or, or one sure. country or, or anything. And, and really they go throughout uh, long, long periods of time, you know, mm -hmm. in thousands of years. So uh, from that perspective, the ideals of the brand uh, we've meant to keep true in how we communicate and make more relevant for young adults or women or Germans or Japanese. Uh, what Harley stands for and how it can be meaningful for them. Okay. And it starts with that truth of uh, the human truth about the brand, not so much you know, captured in one particular stereotypical uh, customer type. So who are you seeing most growth from, though, if you had to? Well, there, the, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. We're, we're in a place where we're able to grow um, with so many different types of customers simultaneously. So in the last five years, we've grown double digits in market share with young adults. Mm -hmm. We've grown double digits in market share with Caucasian men, 35 plus. Mm -hmm. We've grown double digits in market share with women, African Americans, Hispanics, mm -hmm. and continue to grow share in Europe and elsewhere. So all simultaneously. And, um, and that's, that's a great you know, testament, I think, to the power the, of the brand's ideal yep. and the fact that it's, it's multi, it can be relevant to many different types of people simultaneously. And so we don't have one big campaign that washes over everything with one big tagline that everyone's supposed to find something in. Mm -hmm. We have an ideal that's central, and then we, we make it relevant to them within their cultural norms. So young adults have a different sort of cultural norms, mm -hmm. different standards. And the, the women who are considering the brand, even though they might be young, they like apply it in a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Hispanics may look at it a slightly different way. Mm -hmm. They come to the same truth, but they have to find their way into it in slightly different ways. So you're ways. customizing your messaging? So we customize your... our messages very, very much. Um, no singularity, no big campaign. Hmm. Um, lots of little campaigns, lots of little efforts. And a matter of fact, our media is very small relative to our marketing spend. So it's only about 15% of our overall marketing spend. Okay, so, so the, the most, of our our, most of our marketing is experiential and very much touch. Mm. And we may use tech increasingly, but it's really tech for touch's sake, not tech for tech's sake. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the social dynamic of the brand has always been rich. And so now we enable it through technology, you know, Facebook, whatever, um, four and a half million fans um, and highly engaged fans, but 40% of them are young adults. Okay. And, and so it's a really dimensional customer base and it's really fun to go watch them, you know, run into each other, um, not literally, um, you know, to, to meet each other out in rallies and, and do things. And that's what we spend most of our time getting them to liberate themselves through rides. Okay, so really creating live communities, if you will, yeah, gatherings. Yeah, I mean, of, of we, have a, we have an entity called Harley Owners Group, mm -hmm. and it's about a million people around the world. And we call it the original social network because we've had it since 1983, mm. and there was no, I mean, there was computers but they were in you know the DARPA labs somewhere and they weren't they weren't spit out yet for the rest of us to use and uh, but we had a social network then people who are out experiencing uh, our brand and and what it is we enjoy doing mm -hmm. and telling other people about it and maybe it wasn't in as enabled as it is today but the the spirit of it the core of it was very much there and still is and has been for a long long time so we talk a lot about content marketing and you know um, brands as thought leaders and creating right. content to engage with which to engage with um, Customers, are you doing anything like that beyond just the you know the experiences and sort of the live events? Are you actually creating content that you're engaging using to engage with this audience, either well, digitally, socially? Yeah, I think everything we do we consider to be content. Mm. So, you know, so define if, that. Yeah, I, think I mean, it is content. If 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 it's something a customer is consuming about something they care about, like Harley Davidson, mm -hmm. whether it's. Um, a press release of some kind or a, you know a tweet or something we're doing on Facebook or a rally that we're at mm -hmm. or a magazine that we publish we we magazine uh, we publish hog magazine which is uh, 700,000 circulation it's the biggest motorcycle magazine in the United States mm -hmm. and so that's content sure. but it is just a piece of all of the different aspects of Harley that they consume. Mm -hmm. So in sometimes we formally create it other times it's more informal and it's more about us sort of enabling it. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we think it social lives, mm -hmm. is more in the enabling of the stories, not in the, you know, we're going to tell you our story, or we're going to take someone else's story and tell it to you, but more how do we get them all to tell their stories to each other? Sure. How do we get the CEO to tell the story about his experience with Harley to the plumber 
and have him you know, go the other way. And we're starting to see some terrific interactions. Um, there was this uh, one guy who was, uh, you know, through our, our Twitter feed, who was a writer in Egypt. And then there was a, a sort of a red state guy in the U.S. who wasn't quite sure if, if that was all right with him. And they started tweeting back and forth and realizing that actually they shared a lot of interests. And then the guy from Egypt invited the guy to come over. Hey, come on, it's okay, come mm -hmm. ride with me. And the other guy said, yeah, great, cool. Mm -hmm. So it, it's that kind of stuff that really is fun to see inside the brand. It's the stories that are facilitated by others, not just by us. So you had some great results come out recently as far as mm -hmm. sales go. Talk yes. about the breakdown of what's happening in the U.S. versus in other countries. Sure. Um, so Harley is always has been a global brand for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. We we were at dealerships in Japan in the 1920s, and you know, so a few things happened in between there um, that got in the way of that. But over time, um, we've been both an American business, very mm -hmm. strong in the United States, but also global. In the last few years, we've been increasingly global. Uh, we've been growing extremely fast in Asia Pacific and Latin America and Europe a little bit. Less. But a majority of sales still come from the majority of the U.S. is a majority America. of sales is still the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, we are, you know, we have an immense amount of uh, interest in the brand in places like India and like China, and we're already the number one seller of motorcycles in Japan. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a mature market for us. Um, but we entered India only in 2009, so it's very early days. Don't have many dealerships, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. We have 650 dealers in the United States. So you know, comparatively, it's um, very early days in some of these countries. Right. And in a country like India, they sell uh, three million motorcycles a year, hmm. and it's about one tenth of that in the United States. Okay. So it's uh, you know it's very different. It's a. Uh, but Harley is really an American iconic brand. It is, it's, but it's, it's an iconic brand because of its Americanness, yeah. and, and so it is in India. So when we went to India in 2009 and, and said, hey, Harley's coming, you know, surprised us, we're, it was front page news. Mm. And they wanted to you know, do TV news stories about it. Um, and you know, really, in the end, we're a really small motorcycle company in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And we like that feeling, but the meaning of the brand, again, is much bigger than the actual size of our business or the size of our enterprise. And it's that meaning that we like to bring to other places and they like to indulge in. And it's, it's fun to see, really fun. So talk about your current ad strategy. Are you doing the crowdsourcing still? Or are you yes, we are. Okay. Yes, yeah, we've done it for almost three years. Uh, we don't have a lead agency anymore. Uh, we work with a number of boutique agencies for things we need, so media buying or things you know, online. Um, sometimes creative needs that come up where, again, we can't turn to the crowd for something that's mm -hmm. you know, a new product that we can't reveal yet. Um, but it's very rich, and we, we just love the way it engages our, our community in being part of us in just another way. I mean, they want to be part of us. They are us. The brand's really owned by them. You know, so, so I think the whole thing about, well, we're going to tell you our stories, and we right. will control the brand and all that, that that's really a, a myth that maybe marketers tell themselves. This, this, True, you know, but I think arguably not all marketers could do it. I think that there's something unique about the Harley Davidson brand that not, enables. Well, you I think do that. there is something unique about the Harley brand, but I also think there's some fundamental human truths that maybe we overlook sometimes in marketing. Talk about that. What are the takeaways yeah, so, from the marketers? So, how do you, so what are the stories? Yeah. What are the stories within your, within your product, not from you to them, mm -hmm. but from them to them? Mm. So, if it's, you know, pick a really commodity product like a soap, dry, <laughs> drain cleaner. Sure. Okay, drain cleaner. Well, what is what is the drama around drain cleaners? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, it's hey, I got a clog, I gotta get rid of it. But what? How'd the clog get there? What what was the story about how the clog got there? I mean, is are they gonna start facilitating a dialogue about you know who has the hairiest backs in America? <laughs> uh, you know, my husband is the hairiest. You know, I mean, there are stories out there, and it's you know it's silly and it's funny, but why not? There there are stories to be told, but they're happening out with the customers. Mm -hmm. It's not coming from you to them. Right. If you if you do it right, you facilitate a really fun or serious, depending on your brand, mm -hmm. engagement of customer to customer around things that may not be thinking to talk about, mm -hmm. but they have a story. And if they see other people have similar stories, it might actually be the kind of power that you're you're right. not really seeing right now. Great. So where do you go from here? Where do we go from here? You know, again, it's 110 years of of many generations, one baton pass to the next. Um, we are. You know, so happy to, to see young adults you know riding with us. Um, you know, number one selling brand of young adults. We actually sell more motorcycles now to this generation of young adults than when the boomers were young adults. Mm. And what do you attribute that to? The ideals of the brand. 
you know, the ideals of the brand are very rich. Mm -hmm. And and, and so, play right into what millennials are looking yeah, for. Yeah, I mean, right yeah. personalization, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make it my own. Mm -hmm. We've been doing that forever. Mm -hmm. That's nothing new. We started a new factory customization program to make it even easier for them. That's really leads our industry. Mm -hmm. But they were doing that, you know, even before, we were doing that a long time ago. And it's built into our business model. Sure. So that, you know, 92% of our customers customize their bikes. Ninety-two wow. percent. Mm -hmm. So hardly anyone doesn't find something to do to uh, one of our bikes, which is pretty great to begin with, mm -hmm. but to make it even more themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very much on, you know, on point for what uh, a younger generation is looking for. So make it, make it their own. Mm -hmm. Obviously, communities being part of like-minded individuals go, sure. you know, go have experiences as much as we talk about, you know, virtual experiences. Um, Young adults are more and more um, prioritizing real experiences. The stuff that's most interesting in their social networks is not what they were doing in their house, but what they went out and did in the real world. Yep. I mean, though, that's the real that's the right. real content that they're looking to provide, and, and going out and having mm -hmm. a great time on a Harley is is a great thing to share. So um, you know, it's it's about the ethos and the spirit of the brand that's that's sort of been there from a, a long, long time. And some things don't change between generations. You know, hu human. Uh, you know, truths don't really change that much between generations. Mm -hmm. And sometimes products don't really change that much. If you think about Chuck Taylors or Air Jordans or sure. Walkmen or iPods or, you know, Gatorade versus Red Bull, I mean, the, the packaging around it might change. The modernity or the, the relevance of it, uh, its perception might change, but the truth of it may not change all that much. And, and we're not much different from that in the sense that we're loved by many generations. So arguably, a motorcycle could be considered a discretionary purchase, right? I mean, mm -hmm. something you don't necessarily need, mm -hmm. and it's quite an expense. So how do you overcome any sort of um, resistance to, to that purchase when people might have limited resources right. or they may not prioritize it over other expenses? Right. Well, if a Harley means to you what it should as part mm -hmm. of sort of who you are, mm -hmm. you know, your identity is not discretionary. And so... Yes, our volumes decreased when the economy, you know, crashed. Mm -hmm. No question about it. But our market share went up, and so there were other motorcycle choices sure. available to people who wanted to buy a new motorcycle and still had the means to buy a new motorcycle. Mm -hmm. They were cheaper, that were whatever they thought, other good brands, right. and yet they continued to choose us. And then as the economy recovered mm -hmm. in the last two years, our volumes have increased the last two years we continued to gain market share. And so I think it's the choice of what it means to you more than it is a, a cost-benefit analysis of my transportational needs from point A to point B, because that's what Harley really is about. It's about what does this express about me and what, is this, what, is, what does my life mean to me and the things that mean something in my life. We, we heard stories about people who got rid of their house and kept their Harley. <laughs> I mean, tr we got letters about it. And, and so these stories are really rich, they're very interesting, mm -hmm. and, and obviously that's not for not everybody, but there's enough meaning there of uh, what it brings to people and what it means in their lives that isn't really about being discretionary. And um, that transcends the product, That arguably. transcends the product, <laughs> for sure, and, that, and that's really what it's all about, you know, Jenny, and we talked about this, is, you know, it, we never think about it just as, hey, it's a motorcycle. Mm. It is so much more than a motorcycle. Obviously, it is a motorcycle, but it's what does the motorcycle enable me to do and to be, and, and what, is, what does that mean to me? And then how do we facilitate that for people? so that they can have the most fun and they can go to the most places. And you know, now what's really interesting is we've got great customers in Germany and meeting great customers in other places and going riding together and sharing these experiences all around the world. And mm. how do we facilitate even more of those experiences? We'll have a 110th anniversary party in Rome next month. Uh, the Pope is going to do a bike blessing for us. Hmm. Um, you know, th these, are, these are powerful and unique and special moments for our riders that we facilitate, but then their experiences will, will bounce into other people's experiences and create some really fun stuff that uh, gets shared, and that's what makes it fun. So what do you ride? I have two bikes. I have a um, Road Glide Custom, which is uh, one of our more touring bikes, larger, built for long haul distances. Mm -hmm. And I have a V-Rod Muscle, which is a um, liquid-cooled uh, engine that, was, that we co-developed with Porsche. <laughs> um, that uh, is meant to go a little faster. They both go fast, but one goes a little faster, and I can't really talk about it beyond that. 
wear your helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I do wear a helmet. That's true. I do. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny.